Hey, what's going on? All right, let's give this a shot. The next morning, I go back down into my studio and I'm sitting here and I'm just kind of fiddling with the tools. <laughs> the problem with the game that we started to realize there, as we continue to flood the landscape, it slows down the speed of the game. Things start to lag a little bit. In the black areas, when something falls, when something falls fast, you can see how reactive the light touches on these really reflective surfaces. And that's kind of what's causing this game to tax, right? Is because you have such a dark scenery, you have such reactive sculptures that are all falling and falling onto this. It taxes the system itself. So it can't really run properly, especially if you're trying to control something and, and expect it to be super smooth. Little did I know that I was going to be in a world of a mess when it came to actually you know, trying to figure out the system. I thought, hey, you know, it'll be a breeze. I broke the game, started over. Let's make it simple. Let's figure out what we're gonna do next. So I decided that I was going to remake some of the, the landscape as we originally saw it. At this point in the game development, I thought that the entire game would be one single landscape. That the character would be able to run around and you basically ran around and tried to survive for as long as you could. That there would be more and more different obstacles, more characters maybe, more you know, different shapes falling from the sky. Um, at this point we called the game Laser Man, or Laser Guy, just because he was just this dude trying to dodge a bunch of lasers that were flying. This is my favorite tool. Being able to copy and paste stuff and you know multiply and change the shape, it's it's a really sweet thing. And now I'm just kind of filling in, messing around. Unlike most projects that I've ever worked on in my life, I don't really have a goal when I'm doing this. I'm just kind of putting things down and seeing what sticks and, and really just kind of letting myself enjoy and learn the tools and mess around. And you notice, look at my arms in the seat. You know, I'm able to very tactfully move and, and, and interact with this landscape as if I'm kind of some like creator. And, and this is really where my mind starts to run, is just where it looks like sand, where the uh, large, you know, rock-like sculptures are interacting with this kind of sandy looking one. I love that way that looks. It just makes it so natural and so real. So I think, okay, now what I'll do is I'll create a base of these rock-like sculptures and then I'll start maybe duplicating that sandy thing to make it so that it's you know a little bit of both that maybe it's this giant fossil that you're standing on and this is really what's kind of amazing about dreams too is that you can just make something and then go and run around it. and you know unlike a pc game where you know, i have to let somebody sit in my chair you know it's i grew up playing nintendo games i grew up playing playstation games where Everything that I did was on a controller. I, I really, I, I played World of Warcraft, I played some of the PC, you know, very popular MMOs and PC games at its time, but none of it really grabbed my attention as much as, you know, maybe like Super Smash Brothers or Super Monkey Ball or, uh, you know, games like Uncharted, where you, everything was just on a controller. Passing the controller between my brothers, it's such a huge part of my life. And I wanted to be able to have that feeling, and I think that's part of why I was attracted to dreams in the first place is because you could just do that. Like, I could just hand my little brother a controller and he could just play, you know? <laughs> That's so cool. And it's something that, you know, it just takes such an education and such time and experience to do. Or with this, you know, I can really bring my my preconceived notions, my, my conception of how to make art formally with in the context of, of painting and sculpture, and I can really bring that 
that kind of education, that sensibility that I have been trained in, or rather that I've trained myself in, for for all this time that I have, uh, and I, you know, it's brilliant. It's, it's amazing. This is it. I mean, look at look at the way the light is hitting those rocks as it's coming down. I, I mean, it's just so cool. I mean, the fact that I just sat here for maybe 20, 30 minutes and made this sculpture, now I can go down on that microscopic level and run around on top of it. That's amazing to me. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, now <laughs> I know, even though I might be not be able to see myself too well, I, I know that I'm smiling and I know that this is, wow, this is cool. That's a problem. Preparing for this, I've watched a ton of devlogs, a ton of game logs, and you know, maybe it doesn't look like this, but on the out outside looking in, it looks like there was a very clear plan for what is going to take place. And then the person who's executing on the project simply goes and executes on it. With this, it's, I, I'm really more on the teetering on the side of, this is a completely free form exploration of what this tool can do and how this tool can do it. And I wanted this game to develop naturally and, and not in a way that had really a plan, but that we were just gonna kind of follow our stomach and say, this is fun this would be fun, this is fun, and not really be precious about anything, really. And I think you'll see that as these episodes progress, is that there's, you know, I, I mean, this game has gone really far from the time that I'm recording this now, or at least my, I'm speaking about it, to the time that this footage was actually taking place. And it's come a long way. So much time has been dedicated to just the logic and trying to figure out and understand the systems. And I, I want to thank, if I could thank, or if anybody was listening to this who does make logic tutorials, you are a necessary, necessary evil. And <laughs> it is so difficult sometimes to follow along to some of the uh, tutorials that are out there because it's, you know, a lot. some of the information that you find is outdated because this game came out originally in a beta and people started making tutorials for it, but now there's sometimes more efficient and faster ways to do things. And in the logic system, it's, it's very comprehensive and very complex and I'm very glad for it. And I'm or rather, I should be thankful for it because it gives you so much freedom and you can make literally anything. And the game has almost infinite space. And the fact that, not only that, but it's also incredibly accessible, too. I mean, anybody can just pick up a... You just need to get a copy of Dreams, and you can play my game. I can release it to the public at any given time. And it's really just a flick of a switch that you could even play this demo, which isn't even a demo yet. I don't know what it is about large objects, but or just large sculpture, or really big things. It's, it's incredibly inspiring to be able to sit 
next to or stand next to something that's that's much bigger than you and it's cool because you're you know i'm able to extrude out and pull myself out of it using an arm breath right and i can just make and form maybe this asteroid belt or this mountainous kind of thing and then i can stick a dude right in the center of it and then i can start walking around and you'll see me throughout my videos just looking up and it's kind of it's kind of a crazy thing but that's really what i loved most about when these initial sculptures and these initial projects is really just looking up at them and saying wow look at that look at that up there and i think that was really where this project began you know and why i ended up naming it stargazer in the first place just because i was so excited about just looking up so here we're really getting into kind of the meat and potatoes of what this game is about, right? And, and this is kind of the edit that I had made onto the initial, I guess meteorites is what you would want to call it now. Um, yeah, I'd seen them fall. Uh, what we're able to do is as these meteorites hit the ground or any really surface for that matter, there's a certain amount of bounces that will constantly count. And with that, it'll change color and it'll expand and kind of become like a sun almost and then kind of burn out and turn into this meteorite. And here it is kind of getting emitted into the scene. And, and you know, this is kind of the core of the game that we touched on before, but really something that I wanted to advance. Um, another huge aspect of this game is, is darkness in itself. I think that allowing light to be emitted only by the things that can kill you is kind of, you know, a powerful type of a thing that without it, you know, you're in complete darkness, but you know, uh, and with it, you're, you know, with darkness, you're safe. But when you're in the world, uh, you're, you're under attack, right? And that's kind of what I wanted to create that sense of, that sense of panic, maybe? I don't know, maybe I'm reaching way too far for that. But this is, you know, one of the coolest scenes when I first started actually playtesting it. And it's just, I don't know, I just found this so dynamic, right? Living in this world and, and just being able to flick a switch. And now things were happening. One of the unfortunate things about this recording is that my video that you can see on the bottom left is completely covering the life counter. There's a, there's a hundred life counter that's there. We have a hundred life, and any time that you come in contact with a certain object, it does damage to you. Um, now those really small ones, the meteorite looking ones, that one that just flew across the screen, that that'll do damage over time as if it burns you when you get close to it. So you can see how it's it's pooling up in the middle there. Yeah, look, I died. It's pooling up in the middle there, right? And that's kind of, I, I love that so much and I wanted to be able to create that. Um, and, and now you're starting to see, you know, as I'm moving, where the lag is really starting to sit in. And that's a few things it's caused by, right? I touched down in the beginning where it's just so many objects being emitted and thrown into the scene. And as time goes on, it's going to tax on the game, but an, uh, or rather on the, the graphics, right? But the other aspect to that is just the amount of glow, the amount of um, data that it needs to emit that. And, uh, you know, I thought it was a pretty good time at this point, at least to bring in my brothers and my wife into my into my studio and we I was like, all right, let's start playtesting. What do you think? And uh, I, I wish I had the audio for this. Unfortunately, I don't. We'll have to speak over it for now, but maybe I'll get some, you know, fan reactions in the future. But it's, you know, it gets kind of crazy. I think I added a few more emitters as well. Yeah, a few more emitters. And I also made it first person, by the way, which I thought would be a very cool addition. Now you're not seeing the third person character. It would be a little bit more difficult, you know, if you were kind of in the world. And this way, you know, when Dreams does get its VR com capabilities, that this could be something kind of wild to be able to, uh, to experience in VR, which I thought would be amazing. And yeah, it's getting a little bit harder now. So yeah, it's, yeah I mean, it's not... Not a particularly fun game at this point, but you know, it's, it's certainly something. I turned up the lights for when, just to see what it would look like for when Frank started to play. And this is his play test.
Yeah, that's terrible. The fact that you can't jump over a hill is, is just the worst. <laughs> See, he's trying to exploit it and trying to find ways. Very, very talented game tester. And... Yeah. You can see my face, but I'm just like, oh jeez. Like 30 seconds into the game and I'm already, you've already found a way to beat it. You last forever, you win, you have the world record. Oh, you found a cave, how about that? I, I know exactly what he was saying to me at this point. Frank was looking at me and saying, Hey, Ed, I'm winning. I'm winning the game, Ed. What do you think? It's a good game. It's a fun game you made. Alright, it looks like it's Chuck's turn to play. Can get over that hill. Ugh. So much. It's just so cool looking, though. I mean, the fact that I, I like the first person because I think it does a good job of creating that sense of panic, you know. And it's it's kind of like, you know, imagine playing that Donkey Kong barrel game, you know, the very first Mario game that came out, Donkey Kong, rather. That was, uh, imagine playing that in first person, right? So these meteorites jumping at you. And I love how it pulls up. I think that's so cool. Another positive about this is the limited color palette, I think is positive. I, in the other version, there's just so many different colors, so many different light sources that are coming into it it, it kind of gets a little bit overwhelming. And uh, I, I, I like that it's just yellow in this, which is here. So to solve some of my issues, my brothers were suggesting that they wanted to feel like, you know, an astronaut, right? They wanted to feel like they could have zero gravity. And this is what happens when you put on zero gravity. The bounciness of the objects interacts with your character and you essentially just launch up into the sky. Passing it back to Chuck. See, here's where the game starts to break. And this is why, you know, this version of the game is so unsustainable. Because you, you want to be able to balance having a pool of objects, right? I love that aspect that you have a, a pool of these meteorites that are sitting there that'll do damage to you, that you're trying to find a way to survive at the same time that you're trying to dodge new incoming meteorites, right? And, and here you just get launched up in the air. But it, it's unsustainable. You, you, can't, you, you can't just continuously flood the image with such high thermometer objects and expect that the game is going to run perfect you know without kind of removing them so I, I can certainly create a timer and you know a destroyer on these objects that will you know after a period of time destroy them so that as new objects end up entering the world that at the same time you'll be able to you know replenish them so it, it kind of gives the graphics card a little bit of a break but it's just so cool. So trying to figure out a good pattern for that and also trying to make a fun game, right? And it was in this stage that we're not like, I'm not sitting there with my brothers saying, okay, how can we most logically take this game and turn it into something that's going to be fun and playable? No, we're not doing that. We're like, what can we add? What, what would be fun? What would be cool? I made all these extra assets to try to experiment with. Let me make these objects and see what happens. And let's just keep adding to the game and, 
you know, Chuck reaches over to me and he's like, Ed, what if you could pick up the meteorite? What if you could pick up the meteorite and throw it? What if you could pick up the meteorite and put it in a machine and shoot stuff? And, you know, that's, uh, it's just, it's more stuff, but that's the cool thing about dreams is that you can just, you know, the, the tools are so accessible and also so, I guess the word is complex, you know, complex enough that you can really just kind of do whatever you want and make whatever you want. And this is amazing. I mean, I just literally just put in a couple extra assets into the world that's existing, and now you have an entirely different game. You know, this, I think we were thinking that these, you know, extra assets could fall in from the sky as the game progressed, and then you'd be able to climb and traverse these new objects as the world was being filled by this pool of meteorites that were constantly falling. And as the game would progress, and the longer that you'd be able to last, the further that you would ascend into the sky. And this is where Ed breaks the game. You can't, it's just so slow, everything's in slow motion. So there's clearly a problem with this. And I've re I made one version of the game, this is the second version. And clearly something needs to be done, a smarter way of going about all of this. And at this time, we just kept going forward. I'll catch you on the next one.